Greetings, greenhouse people, and welcome to another installment of Tech on Demand, where our goal is always to bring you tips, tricks, and information to produce your best crops ever. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and I am happy to be joined by Andrew Britton, a greenhouse and nursery technical expert with a wide range of experience from large-scale production and propagation to technical services and even sales of foliage and tropical plants. He's been a head grower, a young plants manager, and production manager at some of the largest and most well-respected operations in North America. Interestingly, Andrew was Grower Talk's Young Grower Award winner back in 2005, and I'm pretty sure that's where he and I first met. But today, he's joining me to discuss controlling some of the most common insect pests that impact tropical plants. Andrew, welcome. Thanks, Bill. For the viewers and listeners, Andrew's actually in Florida, lives in Florida, where most of the tropical and foliage plants are produced. So he's really right in the thick of things uh, when it comes to that market. So I guess before we jump into the topic, how are things going out there in the tropical plant world as we head into fall? Well, things are getting cleaned up from spring. Uh, People did not have quite the growth this year that they were getting during the pandemic. But uh, I think most people are planning for 2023 to be similar to 2022 in terms of sales, still dramatically better than pre-pandemic, but uh, unfortunately not seeing the incredible growth that we did see the last two years. Uh, One of the neat things you could see right now is fern baskets are going in. So driving around Homestead, you could see over a million fern baskets getting ready for our upcoming spring season. Oh, that, that's awesome. That's good to hear. And I think that probably mirrors a lot of what the industry is seeing right now with, uh, you know, sales are above what they were in 2019, but probably not on that steep increase that we saw in, in, uh, during the pandemic. But uh, still up, is, up versus past years is good. And uh, hopefully we're able to capture some of the new customers that came to shop during the pandemic and uh, sell them a lot of tropicals and foliage. I know that's a big trend at garden centers certainly all across North America. Yeah, definitely seeing what the economy does is uh, could have a big effect on it. Uh, if we get into a bad recession, it could keep people home and that could spark increased sales once again. But uh, time will tell. Exactly, exactly. And I know that our viewers and listeners are excited to, uh, to see what even the fall uh, ha- has to offer because we are... Uh, you know, the, the economic challenges out there are impacting everybody, but, uh, you know, our industry tends to fare pretty well during uh, recessionary times. So, you know, hopefully we can continue that trend and, uh, and, and build on some of the, the, the growth in, in customer numbers and, and, and everything that we've seen the last few years. So it's actually, it's great to talk to someone who knows this side of the industry inside and out and really gets a chance to visit some of the big nurseries. I mean, that is a lot of fern baskets, and I'm sure a lot of them are uh, are being shipped uh, far and wide to go on uh, to go in, in in yards and gardens and on porches around America. So, as much as I'd love to talk tropical plant varieties, which I think sure we could do all day long and pick your brain on some of the next hot crops, that's really not our plan, as you know. So, but maybe we can do that in the near future. But for now, let's focus on the insects because I know it's something that a lot of uh, a lot of producers and growers deal with um, when growing tropical and foliage plants, and it, it sometimes is a struggle. So why don't you go ahead and share your screen and kick us off with an overview of some of the most common pests dealt with in production and, and maybe what, what the damage looks like. I know that you've got some, some, some good pictures and probably some good stories about uh, insect damage. Some of the most common insects that you'll see on tropicals are very similar to the ones you'll see on bedding plants, aphids, spider mites, mealybugs, whitefly, and thrips. They're all a pesky uh, situation for tropicals as well. So the damage caused by these insects varies quite a bit. Aphids, if you've grown hibiscus, you've probably seen this kind of infestation. It's a very common issue to have massive aphid com- uh, complications on hibiscus. Uh, hibi- our aphids are able to produce up to 12 offspring per day without mating. That's a uh, pretty rapid growth. They are possible to transmit viruses from one plant to another. With, we can see these kind of infestations, but they seldom kill a plant. 
you'll generally just get yellowing leaves that may drop and stunted shoots. Uh, with an infestation as bad as this photo, you can see the buds abort as well. Now, one of the other things that you could see very quickly and probably will tip you off as to having an infestation is sooty mold. These insects create a honeydew, which then can be infected with the sooty mold. So you'll end up seeing this black surface on your leaves. Spider mites are another very common problem with tropicals. Uh, you'll, this is an example of spider mite damage on cordyline, one of the most tasty treats for spider mites. They hatch and complete their development in one to two weeks. They have much more rapid reproduction during the warmer time periods, and you're going to see the infestations more in warm and dry periods. Mites don't tend to like high humidity and high moisture. So when you start getting into dry conditions and warm conditions, be on the lookout for these insects. They use a piercing sucking mouth part to feed on the sap of the leaves, which then gives this stippled look that you could see in the photo. Mealybug on hibiscus are another common problem. I think every uh, hibiscus must be tasty as can be, although I haven't tasted them. Insects generally love them. If you've grown hibiscus, you've likely seen this infestation as well as the aphids. They can lay eggs every 10 to 20 days period, 100 to 200 eggs. It's a pretty rapid increase in production for them and can create a large population very quickly. They feed by sucking the plant phloem out of the cells. Can you believe there's actually over 170 different species of mealybugs out in the world? They just like the aphids uh, secrete honeydew, so you can end up seeing the, the black coating on the leaves as sooty mold. And mealybugs can attack stems, leaves, flowers, and roots. So they can be found all over the plant. And unfortunately, they're covered in a powdery wax, so it makes it a little more difficult to control. Thrips are also a common problem when it comes to tropical plants. You could see the damage here on a brand new growth of Schefflera. The thrips life cycle can be as short as two weeks during the warm periods. So just like the rest of the insects, the warmer it is, the faster these are going to reproduce. The feeding results in scar formation and distorted growth on the plants. And that's because they feed by puncturing the epidermal layer of the host tissue and suck all the cell contents out of the plant. They can have up to eight generations per year. Whitefly on hibiscus, another common problem. Again, like I said, those poor hibiscus are awful tasty. The whitefly feed by sapping uh, out of the cells, causing yellowing or death of the leaves. They're typically found on the underside of leaves, so you're going to be wanting to look on the underside to see if you have any infestation whatsoever. They also secrete honeydew, so it's another one that's going to cause the sooty mold on the leaves for you. And despite their name, they're not truly flies, but are in the order Hemoptera. Those are, uh, those are some of those are pretty ugly pictures. And uh, I think your, your, your advice to look at the underside of the leaves is definitely uh, uh, one that should be taken seriously. Um, I, I think that that gives the, the viewers and listeners a good overview of what to look for. Um, certainly sounds like hibiscus is a crop to keep a very, very close eye on um, in terms of plant damage and really uh, all, all of those crops when you're, when you're making decisions on how to control. And, I, and that's really what I, I, I would like to get into next because you know, obviously if you, if you spot a problem in your greenhouse and you're able to accurately identify that pest, then the next step is what do I do about it and how quickly can I control them? Some of those life cycles are pretty short. Um, and I know you're going to talk about both chemical and biological controls, which is fantastic because in most greenhouses these days, both strategies are being employed at different times, uh, depending on the severity of the problem, as well as combined approaches. So I guess where, where do you want to start when it comes to control? Well, let's start with aphids. 
So for aphids, there are several biological controls out there in the market, one of which is botanogar, a fungus that eats on the, the insects themselves. You could also use Aphidius colmani or Chrysopa carnea. The Aphidius is a parasitic wasp that attacks the aphids, and the Chrysopa is actually a lacewing. They all have good control, but if you have a massive infestation like I showed in the picture before, you're probably going to need to use chemicals first and then come back in with the biologicals. For all of these, the biocontrols are good to keep your populations under control, but they're not necessarily the best option for controlling a massive infestation. For chemical controls, I'd like to use a rotation with multiple different chemical classes, so that way we don't build up resistance with the insects. Some of the chemicals I recommend for aphid per, or control are MPED, Flagship, Endeavor, Mainspring, and Aria. I have listed here on the slide the chemical class that all of these products are in, so that if you want to use other products in conjunction with these, you can make sure that you're not using the same mode of action uh, with your chemicals to avoid the resistance. Spider mites are typically controlled on biological control with parasitic mites. Hard to believe you actually control your mites with mites, but uh, they're very effective. The Phytocilius persimilis, Amblesius adersoni, and the Amblesius californicus are all effective biological control methods for spider mites. Some of the chemical controls that work well are pylon, sultan, avid, fluoromite, and sand mite. And as I go through these, please understand that these are options that you can use and not necessarily the only products that you can use. So if you have experience with something else that works well, just make sure that your mode of action isn't similar to one that we've already mentioned here. Mealybugs, quite the fun little guys. They are easily controlled with uh, biologicals using either Crisopa carnea, which are the lace wings, or Cryptolamus montrezeri. The Cryptolamus are actually a ladybird beetle. So you're using both a combination of lace wings and, and beetles for the control of mealybugs. If you do have a bad infestation or an area that's particularly bad, you can use chemical controls. Some recommendations for that are Measurol, Orthene, Tristar, Rycar, and horticultural oils. Now, as you look at the chemical controls, understand that some of these are going to have a long-term lasting effect on the plants and will cause you some issues for your biological controls. So most bio suppliers will give you recommendations of products that you can use and cannot use around your biocontrols so that you don't destroy your populations. Whitefly, one of your most common points at uh, issues, but uh, can also be an issue on foliage crops. Some of the best controls for biocontrols on whitefly are in Carcia formosa, Eretmosiris eremicus and Amblesius swirsky. The Encarcia and the Eretmosiris are both parasitic wasps, and the Amblesius swirsky is a parasitic mite. Some chemical controls that work well are Avid, Tristar, Mainspring, Contos, and Altus. For thrips control, we have several biological options as well. Aureus lavagatus, Amblesius cucumeris, and Amblesius swirsky. Uh, Aureus is a voracious bug that will eat up your thrips, and the cucumeris and swirsky are both mites, as we discussed before. Some of the chemical controls that you can use are Contos, Mainspring, Measurol, and Overture. And as you look at these chemicals that have been recommended, you'll see some overlap for some insects uh, that it will control both 
you know, for example, thrips or whitefly. So your applications can be dual purpose when you're making them. That's that that's great. Great information. I think um, like like we're seeing in greenhouses, there is probably a uh, uh, conjunctive approach to this is what you know, if I need to use chemicals, how are they going to impact my biologicals? Um, and if I need to establish the biological populations, uh, what, what do I need to be beware of from some residual chemical effects, like you mentioned, and that's, uh, that's very, very good information. I think what I've learned in looking at biologicals over the last couple of years is that the, the biologicals companies have a very good handle on what uh, products, um, what chemical products uh, should be recommended when you're using biologicals. I'm interested in the, the tropical and foliage uh, industry. Are, are biologicals widely used? Is it something that's gaining popularity? What do you, what do you see out there when it comes to, to bios? Yeah, bios are being used quite extensively on the tropical side, the foliage side. Uh, with the longer grow times that we have on foliage crops, establishing a beneficial uh, insect control method in your plants really does give you a lot of, of good control. So I really highly recommend on using bios to start off with, but then you need to keep scouting your crops to see any hotspots that you may need to come in with chemicals to take out. Biologicals are very good for maintaining populations at a very low amount, but once you've got an out of control population, you really do need to go look at the chemical options to target those specific areas. But scouting is the most important thing that you can do uh, for making sure that you get these hot spots under control before they uh, explode into a widespread population through your uh, products. That's true. And I think a lot of uh, ornamentals producers are learning those, those same uh, uh, tips and tricks as well. So I, I really appreciate you going through some of these key pests as well as the control strategies, you know, biological and chemical, because both probably need to be in the arsenal. Is there anything we missed or anything that, that you want to tell the viewers and listeners before we wrap it up today, Andrew? Well, I just want to continue to reiterate that this is a, an integrated pest management program. I think you want to start off with bios as you start your crops, keep scouting your crops to see if any hotspots pick come up. If it's not a real bad hotspot, we may be able to release more insects in that specific area. And if it does become a big problem, then we can come in with spot treatments with chemicals to get rid of that high population area. But all of this is really all intricate together that, uh, you know, it's not a one-stop shop solution. You do need to use multiple control methods in order to keep your pests under control. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that, uh, again, that mirrors a lot of, a lot of what we've been talking about with pest control in the last few years in our industry. And uh, it's, it's something that I think more and more uh, growers are starting to understand. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your time today. It's really been a great tutorial. And I think that, that, uh, our viewers and listeners are probably interested in adding tropicals and foliage into their production mix. They're seeing the trends. They're seeing the, the supply chain uh, improving or changing or shifting a little bit over the last few years and uh, are, are looking to get their hands on these products for sure. And I definitely think we, I can speak for everybody tuning in that, that we really appreciate you giving us a rundown on these common pests and uh, insects and, and ways to control them. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's been my pleasure, Bill. I'm Bill Calkins with Tech On Demand, wishing you all the best in the coming season as you add to your tropical plant mix. Take care out there.